Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, please, we're going to start even though our working group person is not here yet. In the interest of time and efficiency, we will start now. I would invite all of you to come closer to the center of the room. Or as one of our friends said, come to the center of power. This is your only chance. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Debbie Stothard, coordinator of Altsian Burma and secretary general of FIDH, the International Federation for Human Rights. This afternoon, we will uh, be, be covering uh, the situation of land and human rights defenders in danger. This is very much connected to some of the issues raised in the prior uh, plenary in which uh, uh, some of the panelists highlighted the particular struggles of indigenous peoples and other vulnerable groups working to defend uh, their rights to land and our rights to a clean and healthy environment. I'm very happy today to welcome a broad range of panelists coming from different regions, um, especially um, people who have been working closely on the ground with human rights defenders trying to defend, working very hard to defend land rights and environmental rights. Land and environmental rights defenders are a very diverse group. Um, they range from journalists to lawyers like Jorge here, NGO representatives, indigenous and rural and community leaders themselves, working peacefully to highlight the adverse impacts of investment projects, defending the right to live in a healthy environment, protecting natural resources and the livelihoods of their communities. In return for the good work, these defenders have been subjected to surveillance, physical attacks, harassment, and uh, uh, arbitrary detention and arbitrary judicial measures, and in some cases killed uh, in a climate of impunity. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders pointed out that they are particularly disadvantaged due to the often limited knowledge that they have about their rights and the lack of information on how to claim them, scarce resources and weak organizational capacity. When it comes to the danger of being killed, land and human rights defenders are the second most vulnerable group. There are a range of international norms that address the particular situation of land and human rights defenders as part of the broader group of human rights defenders. And I will, I will refer to them later on in this panel. But first of all, I'm very, very happy and proud to welcome our panelists, including, uh, we'll, we'll welcome Pavel when he turns up, um, uh, Mr. Jorge Luis Morales from Guatemala, uh, Mr. Samuel Ngifo, and um, I, I know Harriet's first name, but I'm trying to find my relevant piece of paper here. Sorry, Harriet. <laughs> well, it's, it's always nice when someone from the mission, we, we only know by the first name because we're all familiar and friends. So Harriet Elizabeth Berg, the Minister Counselor from the Permanent Mission of Norway in Geneva. This afternoon also, I have been requested to read um, um, a message from uh, John Knox, the independent expert on the issue of human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Okay, we're going to start um, with Jorge. Now, Jorge, I am shuffling so much paper, it's not funny. I'm so sorry for the trees. Okay, Jorge Luis Morales is a lawyer and member of the Verapaz Peasant Union Organizations, UVOC in Guatemala. He works with local communities and day laborers, not in Guatemala City, but in the highlands of Guatemala, in the struggle to defend land in relation to agribusinesses, including the production of biofuels and timber, 
And Jorge also assists those, acti those ex activists who are being criminalized, criminalized including um, people who have been working, day laborers who have also been working for their labor rights and in this context their rights to a livelihood. Um, my question to Jorge is to share with us, Jorge, can you share with us the greatest challenges and uh, the types of violations facing defenders who are defending land and human rights? And what do you see um, as the role of UN Special Procedures, in particular the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights? What would you like them to do? Thank you, Jorge. You have five minutes. En primer lugar, quiero, quiero agradecer muchísimo esta oportunidad de estar acá en un lugar, en este foro, en este foro que ha sido muy enriquecedor para, para mi persona, pero al mismo tiempo, como yo traigo la representación de muchísimos campesinos de Guatemala, muchísimos mozos colonos de Guatemala, que están situados en el área de, de las Verapaces, y en la región de Izabal. Entonces, el, el trabajo que yo realizo, el, el trabajo que hacemos las comunidades y la organización UBOC es luchar por la tierra, luchar por los derechos laborales de los jornaleros en las grandes fincas de empresas de producción para agro, agrocombustibles o madereras. Producers, the primary ways that these defensors and community leaders can, it's a variety. It constitutes a complex problem from threats, threats, death threats. Anyone, any, any, in any legal area that they are directed towards, uh, the object of when, when, and action is initiate, initiated to a, wor a leader in the working community, in the worker, in the campesino movement. It's a large suffering that families suffer from which these, con these people come from. In other words, the leader suffers, the family suffers. The actors, the principal players, the many, many factors or principal players, but they can be, they can be assumed, they can be or where you can imagine from where all these threats come from. You can imagine, usually they're from people, persons who are related to these corp corp companies, empresas, people who work for the very same enterprises companies or security companies, the security forces of these very same companies. There's intimidation, a series of attacks. It happens in many. It's a wide, wide range. They per persecute. They, they, there's vigilance. There's harassment. There is physical blows, physical blows, bodily harm, and to the extreme of murders, assassinations in Guatemala. Unfortunately, there's so many assassinations within the context of, for example, people that have defended their right, their land rights, or people who have defended the existence of a working, a original working relationship on verbal contracts. People who, let me explain that in Guatemala, particularly in the Verapaces region, the hundreds of thousands of Colonos, indigenous people, workers, campesinos, peasants that live in these fincas, these homesteads that have been abandoned in these homesteads and that have been ignored by the very state, the very nation of Guatemala, because these are communities that are surviving, surviving in, in very precarious conditions, subsistence conditions. I don't have enough time here to enumerate the conditions. Also, we see other attacks, defamation. Many of these leaders are defamed, suffer defamation, especially through the, me the media, newspapers, creating in, this, in society an idea that 
this person, this leader, this peasant is a harmful person to the society, or someone that has a, a criminal profile. So society renders its conclusions, and that causes a lot of da damage, not only in the, the leaders, but in the very communities from which they come. They block. They impede their jobs, their, their efforts. The majority of the things that they do is defending defending the indigenous and minority rights and the people that are representing the land rights. This harassment is extreme. Defamation is extreme. To the extreme of harassment and, and also calling them terrorists, um, the appellations of terrorists, accusing these, these uh, workers, these leaders, they're saying that they are opposing the right to development, development. They are harassed. They are. After this, there's a very important issue that that rises, and that, and it was it was. The, the finger was put in the eye. Let's say, or let's say, the attention is now clear on this matter. This criminalization of these leaders, criminalizing the the people who. They, they undergo in, in, an enormous amount of pro, uh, legal processes where they have to, it must be said, there's a complicity. There's a complicity from the public ministry, the local public ministries I'm referring to, on the, on the municipal level, the attorney generals, and all these levels. It, it's a, how do you, there's an associated, things happen in a, in a sort of a fan type of thing. They all come together to criminalize these legitimate actions, legitimate defenders of the indigenous and minority rights of the people of Guatemala. There's a concern, a huge concern, a very important concern. Many of these indigenous communities, many of these indigenous communities exist before the, the census, the registries before the registers, registers of property rights. They have been in these present for more than 200 years. They have been here before. But they don't have, they don't possess any legal documentation, title, deeds, where they can be accredited as, be accredited, accorded that right of ownership. Not only, not only throughout the time that they were, that they had this working relationship, I already mentioned they were abandoned, they've been left throughout that time. They had a contractual, a difficult contractual bind in difficult conditions. That they were operating in infra-human condi conditions. They never had access to minimum wage. In terms of the criminalization, I'm going to mention the case of the finca called Primavera Spring, where the leaders, the homestead, are being processed for nine or more infractions they are procuring to resolve one, and another another legal process is in, is brought upon them. This is happening. It's a very difficult situation that they are that they're going through. The Guatemala peasants is a very difficult position. After hearing about Gracias, Jorge. Luego de escuchar los diferentes problemas a los que están sujetos los dirigentes campesinos de la seguridad personal y el hecho de que los dirigentes eh, al ser atacados eh, las consecuencias las paga toda la familia la negativa de reconocer eh, los derechos consuetudinarios de la tierra según diversas normas internacionales y la complicidad de las autoridades locales Hemos ya escuchado todo eso. Ahora vamos a pasar a Samuel Gifo, secretario general del Centro para el Medio Ambiente y Desarrollo de Camerún. Eh, Samuel también es abogado. Eh, yo estoy rodeada de abogados, pero eh, no se los voy a eh, tomar en negativo. Pero él es el director del Centro de Yaoundé recibió el precio Goldman para el medio ambiente en 1999 y como él dijo, eso ya hace mucho tiempo, pero él sigue trabajando, sigue dando una buena batalla 
y está centrado en la protección de los derechos comunitarios en el contexto de la explotación de los recursos humanos, la tierra y la silvicultura. Eh, Samuel, cuéntanos cuáles son los desafíos principales a los que hace frente los defensores del medio ambiente y de la tierra, quiénes han sido objeto de persecución y qué es lo que tú quisieras que los procedimientos de Naciones Unidas, incluyendo el Grupo de Trabajo, hicieran para ayudar en esta situación. Thank you so much, Ms. Chair. Gracias. Quisiera, en primer lugar, disculparme por mi voz. Yo vengo de Camerún, donde hay mucho sol, y cuando llegué aquí estábamos a un grado sobre cero y me enfermé. Y no estaba yo preparado para esas temperaturas, pero... Yo vengo de Camerún y yo trabajo en el Congo Brazzavil. Es un grupo de seis o siete países en la África Central que compartimos muchos recursos naturales, muchos de silvicultura, mucha tierra y eh, tierra vacía, como decía la gente, y también eh, minerales y petróleo. Y lo que nos dimos cuenta es que para las comunidades en toda la cuenca del Congo no hay un mundo único que establezca una diferencia clara entre la tierra, la silvicultura y otros recursos. Hay quienes hablan de nuestros bosques, pero eso también incluye a la tierra. Entonces, es una visión holística de los recursos. Entonces, si ustedes toman los recursos de la tierra... La tierra vacía no tiene ningún valor para la gente ahí. La tierra es lo que ellos necesitan, tierra y recursos, es lo que ellos necesitan para la vida cotidiana. Y también nos hemos dado cuenta de que todos estos países tienen en común unas políticas muy agresivas para atraer los inversionistas extranjeros directamente y ellos, la mayoría, están interesados en los recursos natu naturales. Entonces, si vemos las estadísticas en los últimos seis o siete años, vamos a ver que el flujo de inversionistas en África Central va en aumento a una velocidad enorme y el, uh, el índice de crecimiento de todos los países de la región también va en aumento muy rápidamente. Pero, al mismo tiempo, en los índices de pobreza también van en aumento. Hay mucho más dinero que llega, sí, pero sigue habiendo mucho más pobres en los países. La razón principal de esto es que la redistribución de la riqueza no se hace correctamente, no se hace con equidad. Y ahí creo yo que es donde radica el problema principal. Eh, las empresas llegan, con, los inversionistas invierten en tierra y en otros recursos, pero a la larga en sus actividades el resultado lleva a restricciones de acceso a los espacios para, que las, comun para las comunidades que usan los recursos para su vida cotidiana. Y entonces una vez que les quitan esos recursos, pues se quedan más pobres que, está, que antes. Es el principal problema. Para que los países resulten más atractivos a los inversionistas, es necesario invertir mucho en una infraestructura muy amplia. Pero para hacer eso también es necesario tener más tierra, porque si quieren construir una, una presa, pues se lleva mucha tierra y recursos. You need to have a lot of foreign debt to build the infrastructure, to take the land, and all this put together results into loss in access to resources and space for the communities. What are the problems? What happens is that the communities start resisting. They start fighting because if you put together mining, logging, land concessions for agro-industry, now you have land concessions for carbon, you have environmental offsets, All together you have no space left for community use. They can see this trend and they start resisting. They don't know the laws. They don't know their rights. What they are fighting for is not for their rights. They are fighting for survival. This is what they do. They say, if we don't fight today, we will have no more space where to go. They say we have to fight because if I'm taken out of my land, then I have nothing else to, lo to lose. 
I don't know where to go and I have nothing else to lose, so I have to fight. This is the situation. What we are seeing is that as a result of the resistance, the government is helping the companies to uh, fight the resistance. Local government, but also the central government, are working together to organize the legal harassment of the communities. Of course, because the communities do not know their rights, they do some mistakes. Sometimes they are violent, they block some routes, and this becomes the problem. The problem is not what happened for you to get angry, but what, what have you done when you get angry? This was a problem. You did something against the law, and you will go to jail because of that. Or you will go to court so many times, you will lose so, many, so, so much money that uh, at the end of the day, many people in the communities will clearly understand that this is probably not the way to go. They are too strong to be for us to fight them. This is what uh, emerges as a trend. And I think this is also very clearly one of the objectives of the fight against this resistance, is to discourage everybody, every community, trying to push uh, the companies and to make sure that the companies understand that they have to take into account community rights. One of the reasons why it's so difficult for the communities to fight and to be successful is that most of the rights for which they are fighting are not formally recognized in the laws, in the domestic laws, exactly as in, the, in Guatemala. Land rights, communities have no land rights. Rights to the forest, absolutely nothing. Only what is given by the state and is not property, is not ownership. So, what to do? I think there is a very clear role for the, the UN procedures and working group into uh, such a process, such a trend uh, in Central Africa. We don't have the impression that the government is clearly understanding its role and that the companies investing are clearly understanding their role. And I, we think it's not the responsibility of NGOs to go to the government and to the investors and tell them what they have to do. I think the UN is better place to uh, take such a role. So to me, this will be the most important role. They have to know that what they do is against the international commitment of the state and that they have to change. One very last thing before I finish. There is a report, there was a report published uh, this year, 2013, by a consultancy group, a consultancy working for investors. Most often the investors think when they invest in places like Guatemala or Cameroon, they can earn a lot of money because they can they don't have to spend money and time in dealing with human rights, for example. But this report says in places where the rights are not properly recognized and protected, investors going in are at risk of losing a lot of money. And we have seen it in many places in the Congo Basin. So I think this should be a very clear message for investors also. It's in their interest to work together with the state and with the communities for the recognition and the protection of community rights. Thank you, Mrs. Chair, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Samuel. Um, uh, in response to the cases highlighted in Africa and uh, the situations highlighted in Africa and in Latin America, I've been requested to also highlight certain cases that are presented in this very, uh, very reader-friendly and compact report um, titled Land and Environmental Rights Defenders in Danger, an overview of recent cases. Um, the, the complicity of local authorities, the lack of legislative protection for the rights of communities, the refusal to recognize the customary land rights of uh, local people, rural and indigenous peoples, um, is very similar to the experience of um, human rights defenders on land and environment in Asia and other parts of the world. Um, 
Uh, I've been working on the situation in Burma for uh, 25 years since I was in kindergarten. And um, one of the cases, uh, despite this big flurry of releases and amnesties of human rights uh, uh, political prisoners, the new prisoners, the new arrests and detentions in Burma are actually targeting land and environmental rights defenders, uh, including uh, the more recent case of Mr. Ko Tin Jo, who was kept in jail despite the release of other political prisoners. He was uh, imprisoned uh, for uh, protesting against land grabbing. He was charged under the Peaceful Gathering and Demonstration, demonstration Law. And after he was sentenced to jail, he was sub subjected to more prosecutions, which is very similar to the situation um, that Jorge and Samuel uh, has shared, that local people are being subjected to multiple cases and where they are basically being put in a situation where they are not just denied access to justice, but it's becoming too expensive and too burdensome to even defend themselves um, against charges and against official persecution and harassment. Um, in the Philippines, um, Mr. Moses Fuentes, um, a member of the Bukindon chapter of the Human Rights Defenders Filipinas and a local leader of the farmers' organization, Kuya Christian Farmers Association, was gunned down in June, on June 16th last year by an unknown assailant, and he died on the spot. Um, Venezia Indai Nestor an, uh, uh, was another, Philipp, uh, another human rights defender from the Philippines, was just gunned down dead. She was shot dead in public on the side of a highway in June last year, and she was actively pushing for land redistribution. So the cost is very high indeed. The reason I am using up all this time is that I have been informed that Pavel Suyanziga, the chair of the UN, work, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, has disappeared. I hope this is a pleasant disappearance and not an enforced or involuntary dis disappearance. So, um, but um, um, in lieu of that, or in addition to that, I have been requested uh, to read out a statement before we move on to Harriet, uh, to read a statement from John Knox, the independent expert on, let me get a breath, the issue of human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. So... I don't know how, what he sounds like, so I will not try to imitate his accent or his voice. I'll read it as myself, but it is just imagine it's John. All human rights defenders have rights to meet peacefully to promote and protect human rights, to seek and obtain information about human rights, to disseminate information about human rights, and to draw attention to whether they are observed in practice, to have ex effective access to participation in government, and to benefit from remedies for human rights violations. These rights apply no less to human rights defenders seeking to exercise them for the protection of the environment than they do for other purposes protective of the full enjoyment of human rights. In practice, environmental human rights defenders have proved to be especially at risk when trying to exercise these rights. The Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders has reported that environmental rights defenders face a high risk of killings, attacks, assault, threats, and intimidation from both state and non-state actors. The situation of environmental rights defenders is often overlooked, perhaps because they do not always fall neatly into the categories of human rights or of the environment. 
This panel is an important opportunity to address this omission and to bring, bring greater de attention to this global problem. And when what John Knox, the independent expert, uh, highlights is also the importance of the uh, any the importance of reminding ourselves of the international norms relevant to this situation and this topic. And it's important for us to remember that principle 18 of the UN guiding principles states that business enterprises should identify and assess any actual or potential adverse human rights impacts with which they may be involved, either through their own activities or as a result of their business relationships. This process should involve meaningful consultation with potentially affected groups and other relevant stakeholders as appropriate to the size of the business enterprise and the nature and context of the operation. The UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders also uh, reiterates and backs up the assertion by our human rights defenders here that land and human rights defenders should enjoy protection from persecution, harassment, and physical threat because it, when they are working to pro promote land and environmental rights. So that, in a way, brings us to Harriet. Harriet Elizabeth Berg is Minister Counselor and permanent, from the Mi Permanent Mission of Norway in Geneva. I have been told not to be gentle with you. I've been told to be gentle with you. <laughs> so I have only three questions. <laughs> I don't know. These three questions look a bit loaded. So uh, Harriet, how do you see the role of home states of business enterprises in preventing repression of human rights defenders? I think um, this is actually very relevant to what uh, Professor Stiglitz said in the earlier session especially when we talk about access to justice for affected communities. For example, in the case of Samuel's uh, scenarios and the situation faced by Jorge, if it was a Norwegian company, for example, do you think that Norway should, allow, should uh, guarantee access to justice in Norway if the courts in Latin America or Africa or even Asia um, are unable to grant it to them? especially if it's a Norwegian company. Um, that's question number one. Question number two. In your view, what should businesses do as part of their due diligence processes to make sure they do not contribute to uh, not, and are not complicit with human rights and abuses committed against human rights defenders? And then, this is a, a little bit more complicated, Harriet. I'll, I'll actually give you the hard copy of this. I think you have it. Mm -hmm. uh, given Norway's support to initiatives on human rights defenders, as well as its OECD proactive agenda on meaningful stakeholders' engagement in the extractive industries, how do you promote the role of human rights defenders as meaningful and relevant stakeholders in particular, in repressive environments. All of us are wait, awaiting, pen poised, with bated breath for your replies to these three questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, a very timely and a topical panel uh, that you have organized. Uh, as uh, several speakers have said earlier today, um, uh, this is an increasingly important issue, uh, and reports are alarming. Uh, we see more reports now than they did previously on this uh, challenge. Um, I also think that it's, uh, it's a real loss uh, for 
uh, business and for uh, societies and for communities uh, that those that are very knowledgeable about the issues on the ground uh, and that also are a very valuable channel uh, to uh, vulnerable groups uh, that should be heard uh, in these cases that they are harassed and intimidated and uh, even killed. Uh, this is, uh, of course, um, very negative in itself, but is also negative for the larger community. Um, when it comes to your questions, uh, we, we base ourselves on the previous panel uh, that I guess that most of you attended, um, uh, which also discussed uh, a range of these issues. Uh, for a home state, uh, I think that it's important to actually uh, go to this with, in a very comprehensive way. There are many things that home states could do, and they're all covered in the UN guiding principles, of course, but I'll just uh, uh, mention a few of them. Uh, mm -hmm. We have, to for, have, of course, all the laws and regulations uh, that have to be in place uh, based on the international obligations that we have there, uh, and I must underline that I believe that we do have have uh, a good range uh, and, and probably uh, close to total uh, range of international uh, uh, conventions and treaties that we can base ourselves on to make sure that we have the correct uh, regulations and rules in place. Um, but in addition to that, we can do uh, many things to make sure that we have a good and comprehensive incentive system. I mean, businesses operate often based on what kind of incentives and disincentives they see in society. Um, and they go much further than the laws and regulations. What we, of course, have is um, public procurement as a positive incentive uh, uh, for business. Uh, if you know that uh, you will not get that, uh, that uh, uh, possibility to deliver whatever uh, to a ministry because you don't have your policy statement in place or you don't do your due diligence or we know that you're doing something uh, in certain countries, uh, that seems to be on the edge of uh, being legal uh, if we know then that what you won't get that contract. Uh, that is certainly a very strong incentive. Uh, credit expert systems is, is another incentive uh, that can be used. I also believe that what the UK have in their national action plan is setting clear expectations to business on what they expect them to do uh, when they are operating uh, abroad uh, is important. Um, uh, Norway has even gone as far as to establish 10 points uh, document on, together with business and civil society on how Norwegian companies should plan and carry out stakeholder dialogues. So they are going even further when it comes to say what they expect from business. I think that the point that we maybe are discussing a bit too little uh, is how we also work to uh, secure the international framework uh, in this area. I'm not talking about treaties or conventions uh, or instruments, but I'm talking about, for instance, the World Bank. The World Bank is presently discussing their safeguard uh, policies uh, and reviewing it for the future. Uh, it's a, a clear issue that um, one should look at how human rights should be uh, included in these safeguard policies. That's something that home states can do, and they can do it together with NGOs uh, and with business uh, and with other states. Uh, and this pertains to uh, also the guidelines and other guidelines as well. Uh, certainly a lot of room there. When it comes to um, uh, uh, the direct protection of human rights defenders, I also think that that might be a bit overlooked. Um, we have guidelines uh, for our embassies on how they should work with human rights defenders. This is something that can be applied directly in uh, relevant uh, issues uh, where we can actually uh, support uh, human rights defenders uh, with different uh, economic resources. Uh, we can link them up with businesses, uh, our own businesses that are uh, investing in these countries to make sure that they have a dialogue with the human rights defenders that they should meet. 
uh, we can uh, uh, contribute to training, and we can do a lot of things to empower uh, these right holders. Uh, and I think that also replies to many other things there. I mean, we could see our embassies or diplomats actually coming to court cases, uh, sitting in to be witnesses uh, in court cases and support in that way. So I think that we can be very active in empower empowering human rights defenders. And all this, together with the dialogue that we have a business, will create an incentive structure uh, that is so comprehensive that it's difficult for a company to actually uh, come into a situation and not knowing uh, what they should do. Okay, so let's say that now we, we have them knowing uh, what uh, to do uh, in principle. And then it's a question of what do they actually do and what could they do when they go, uh, uh, are, are going through their due diligence processes and have got that far. And that's your second question. Um, I think it starts with knowledge. And there's a lot of uh, activities ongoing to develop guidelines and to discuss stakeholder dialogues and how that can be done. Uh, there is also quite a lot of um, competence now and knowledge on how what is normally going wrong. Uh, we know that normally we are uh, companies are quite good at uh, uh, pitching and disclosure and kind of informing about what they are intending to do, but they are not that good at two-way communications where we're going into consultation and agreeing on how we can deal with uh, difficult situations. So there are certain certainly more to do uh, when it comes to knowledge building, but uh, I think that uh, it, that is probably the easiest part. I think that a challenge for business when they go into new uh, markets uh, like this or when they're going into complex situations is that they have to kind of turn their stakeholder map on the head. Uh, normally, when they want to have something done, uh, they look at who are the influential people here, and then they approach them, and then they try to have a good dialogue with them and build trust with them, and in that way, in the longer run, they will they will get uh, their projects uh, uh, agreed upon. Now, what they have to do when they go into uh, situations that, uh, uh, where we know that we have to uh, talk with people uh, on the ground, uh, or we know that they have to talk with people on the ground, is that you have to look at those that are not influential. You have to look at the bottom of your stakeholder chart uh, and look at those that you normally would not talk to because they are the ones vulnerable and weak groups, and they are the ones that you have to understand the situation now. And I think when you are then turning your stakeholder map on the, on the head, that's when you really need the human rights defenders because there are this resource and it's because there are these, uh, this channel uh, to these vulnerable groups. So this is a change of approach that companies have to learn and have to think about that. Um, uh, and that is not only about uh, guidelines and reading all the books, this is really about changing a company culture. Um, which is not happening overnight. Uh, it can often happen through having a crisis so that you have to change your company culture. Uh, but, uh, but it's taking place. Uh, and uh, because you know, when you, when you go into these complex situations, sometimes you can kind of follow a, a list of issues that you should do or a process that you should follow. But when you get into a very, very complex situation with maybe a very urgent conflict, uh, you have to base yourself on values and, and, and knowing what to do in these very difficult situations. You have to have good company values. Then I also think that another thing companies need to do is to know their dilemmas. Uh, companies uh, can often be in a situation where they know that there's a conflict between what is expected from them locally and based on local law and what is expecting from them um, based on international human rights. Uh, for instance, when a company is asked, a telecoms company is asked to disclose information about their customers, or when they are asked to uh, close down the network because there's a demonstration coming, and you know that there might be human rights abuses coming uh, based on this, what do you do? Do you risk to lose your license, or do you uh, rather stay uh, and, and follow up and risk uh, abusing human rights? 
this is when you need to have a clear idea about what your dilemmas are and when, how you deal with that. So that's also a part of the culture, but know your dilemmas, be prepared for that. Then, uh, uh, to, to try to wrap up, uh, I also think that we need to, uh, to have companies knowing when they want to exit. Uh, sometimes it's just not impossible either not to enter or that they have to exit. Uh, when you're not able to influence the situation that you're in, when you're not able to do what you think is correct, also think that it's important to exit. And then to turn back again to the role of home states, I think that actually talking with business about these uh, situations, the challenges, the dilemmas, and be a good partner uh, in what we cannot kind of write down in guidelines uh, is also very important, uh, to have diplomats that are able to talk with them, to have ministers, uh, uh, representatives that are able to talk with them about that. Thank you. I, sorry I didn't get through the whole thing, but I hope to get back to it. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, just one question, uh, which I'm going to reiterate. Do you think home states of corporations have a responsibility to ensure access to justice? when affected communities are unable to uh, access the judicial mechanisms effectively in their own country. Now, as a representative of Norway, I'll be careful of saying what I think about what is right and what is wrong. Um, I see that uh, that opportunity is available in certain, uh, certain states, uh, and that's a posit positive opportunity. Um, uh, but to say that that is an approach that all states should choose to, uh, to have uh, is something different uh, because uh, here we have long legal traditions and a lot of interests. But uh, that there are, uh, there are um, states that offer that today and I think uh, that is possible. Thank you, Margaret. I'm pleased to welcome Pavel Suzyan Ziga from the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Welcome from the World Organization Against Torture, the International Federation for Human Rights, Peace Brigades International, Center for International Environmental Law, Earth Rights International, Friends of the Earth International, Global Witness, International Land Coalition, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Sorry, um, interpreters, you don't have to translate this part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> International Union for the Conservation of Nature, National Committee of the Netherlands, and International Service for Human Rights and Forum Asia. So, Pavel, I'm going to give you a quick roundup. Um, we have heard from Jorge, a human rights lawyer from Guatemala, and Samuel, um, also a human rights lawyer uh, from Cameroon, working in their respective regions. Um, land and environmental defenders um, who also include indigenous communities and rural communities, have been subjected to the whole range of um, threats against their person um, and other forms of intimidation, including judicial harassment and arbitrary detention. In many cases, leaders, community leaders are subjected to multiple court charges, um, and are put in a situation where they are denied access to justice and access to effective remedy. What is particularly distressing is that um, when they are defending land and environmental rights of their communities, they are essentially fighting for the right to survival because in most cases, the land, they need land to grow food to feed themselves. We are also seeing a vilification of land and environmental defenders, in some cases being labeled by the state as terrorists, threats to society, criminals, even in the case of Cambodia being called separatists. Um, the, the many states are complicit um, in this harassment and intimidation both at local municipal level and at national level. And uh, most of these threats come directly from uh, subcontractors or 
staff, security personnel of the businesses engaged at the ground. So, um, and also our, the states themselves refuse to recognize the customary land rights of many of the affected communities. Uh, so in such a picture, sorry to um, make you have to work very hard, you just arrived. Um, in such a picture, what has the UN Working Group uh, been able to do so far on the issue of protection of human rights defenders working on land and environmental issues? And how do you see the work of the Working Group? Um, uh, what direction do you think the Working Group can take in order to enhance its efforts to ensure greater respect and protection of land and human rights defenders? That's the first question, and then I'll go through the questions uh, as you answer them. Добрый день. Спасибо большое for an opportunity provided to take part in the discussion. I beg to excuse me for not being here at the beginning of your session, side event. The matter of the fact is that I have had a number of meetings, including the rights of the indigenous peoples related to the conflicts with the business enterprises. So my apologies. I would like to be brief, understanding that there are many people wishing to speak. So preempting uh, your reaction, I would like to mention that I came to the human rights defending activities regarding the uh, peoples when a territory of my people was sold out to one of the corporations, business corporation. At that time I was a teacher of mathematics and I was planning to work the whole life in this field. But after selling out uh, my land, my compatriots asked me to help them in this struggle, in this fight. It was uh, in 1989, and since that time I am dealing with the defense of the legitimate rights of indigenous people. As far as the pressure provided uh, um, by uh, different uh, corporation on human rights defenders. I know very well about the situation. I met on various occasions with various uh, community leaders, uh, including the uh, my people, uh, and uh, I know about the suffering they are faced with defending their legitimate rights. I meet with a situation like that uh, during my everyday work. But the only one I want to say is that the long way, the long run starts with the first step. And when in 1989 my community started to fight for its legitimate right to uh, land, I'd like to mention in this respect that According to the new Russian legislation, we received a transfer document in a eternal use by our people. This is an enormous space, and today our community is the legitimate owner of this territory. We did not admit any business to our land not due to the fact that we are, are going to stop the economic development. No. The reason was different. We think that this economy, including the business proposals, are very dangerous and harmful for our community, and we have not yet accepted any proposal from the business. But nowadays, the president of our 
country has recently signed an uh, ordinance about the creation of a national park on our territory in order to safeguard the environment uh, of my community, my people, Udege. It was worth enormous efforts, nervous uh, stresses, and so on and so forth. But we succeeded in our fight, and now we are cooperating very closely to the government, with the government, to uh, uh, establish a national park on our territory. As far as the UN Working Group is concerned, we are discussing at length uh, the issue of the assistance provided to the uh, human right defenders, because they, these people is on the front line with the intimidation and any repressions uh, subjected to. But we cannot overjump our mandate on the other side. And uh, we have to work in accordance with our mandate uh, given to us by the Council on Human Rights and to work according to our opinion, not only to our opinion, but to our special procedures. We are sending letters to these or that uh, bodies or states uh, uh, witnessing the violations or abuses of human rights in these countries. So, we are organizing as well the events which, to our opinion, need some actions in view of the fact and some tragic events. For instance, uh, the fire of a factory in uh, Bangladesh. So, I uh, also want to say that within the framework of the events we are organizing all over the world, we have, have carried out the first regional meeting for Latin American and within the framework of this meeting we have had a meeting with representatives of NGO. I know that in a number of uh, human rights defenders there are some questions to our work. Uh, as a person who is dealing with this issue for a long time, I know uh, the problems of the human rights defenders. And I think that criticism is very uh, constructive for us. We have to go deeper and deeper into the issues of human rights defending the uh, community rights defending, uh, which are in this, on that way, are pressed by the business. And also, uh, we discussed today uh, the issue, and I think that the position when a number of organizations and communities refuses the dialogue with representatives of business structures, I think that this is my personal opinion. I don't think this is a very correct position. The, the dialogue should exist. We have to organize such a dialogue. And in this dialogue, try to uh, prove our right position. In uh, New York, in the United Nations premises, uh, taking into account the experience of fight of my co country and my people, uh, I declared uh, in New York that once, that I will never sit at the table with the representatives of business because I consider them my enemies. My position now changed, but I have not betrayed my principles. I think that business, indigenous people, state, society is general. This is the whole humanity, and we, in any case, have to find a dialogue, a discussion, 
in order to find the verity. The, it will be a diff- difficult way to the verity. And nobody will be happy with the results, but the dialogue is necessary, absolutely necessary. Thank you very much for your attention. Спасибо, Павел. Имейте в виду, что э, рабочая группа не прыгает через свой мандат. Я хочу сформулировать мандат так, что э, в рамках... Consultation with potentially affected groups and other relevant stakeholders. Um, will you be strongly encouraging the working group to highlight to the business and community and to, mem- to states that land and environmental hum- de- rights defenders must be included in that group? Uh, uh, to be involved in meaningful consultation. And when we mean meaningful consultation, we mean a two-way process whereby the defenders are not subjected to physical or official harassment in any shape or form. Will you be willing to tell us that you will be strongly encouraging the working group to pursue that. And that is very similar to what Harriet has said in terms of businesses having to turn their stakeholder map upside down in order to do their work effectively. (coughs) Yes, certainly. Yes, certainly. Мы должны вести такую работу для того, чтобы и бизнес, и государство понимали, что в данном случае, когда вот я в первом своем ответе я говорил и призывал гражданское общество, то, то же самое относится и к бизнесу, и к государствам. Что моя позиция, я ее высказываю всегда, что никто не должен считать себя пупом земли, вокруг которого должно все вращаться. Я считаю, еще раз хотел бы подчеркнуть, что и бизнес, и государство должны понимать, что только в режиме диалога, в режиме выслушивания оппонентов можно прийти к разумным решениям и компромиссам meaningful solution of the compromise. As far as the working group is concerned, uh, during our first forum, we have uh, arranged for official discussions with the communities who suffered from the business activities. Well, um, we are coming to the final bit, which is um, input from the audience. We all have, um, we all have established very clearly that we shouldn't be separating human rights defenders from land and environmental defenders because as human beings we need land and environment. It's part of our human rights. So we got that happening. We all understand that land confiscation and land grabbing has become a global epidemic affecting people and communities all around the world. And people uh, from the panelists have already started to uh, speak up about some of the possible solutions and recommendations. I have here three people, four, five, six. Oh, okay. I'm going to stop at, stop at five. We have uh, Sarah, Laurie. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry? Yes. Okay, and uh, someone at the back there, and then, jo- uh, jo- and sorry, and Genevieve. Okay, and then Joanne later. So can I can I start with Sarah, Laurie, and the person in black next to uh, Joan? So Sarah from Anne and Laurie, uh, very briefly. 
en este contexto donde vemos fuertes desigualdades entre las empresas y las comunidades, donde estamos constatando la falta de mecanismos vinculantes para obligar a las empresas a cumplir how we're losing lives, how we're being criminalized, our protests and manifestations. In the opinion of the panelists, Madam and Miss, what are the measures could the UN take to protect these human rights defenders, these people, these land rights defenders? Lori? Thank you. I'm happy to address this wonderful side event and thank all the organizers of it. My name is Laurie Tanner, and I'm working with numerous NGOs in the creation of an international initiative focused on land and environmental defenders. I'd like to invite everyone in this room to pick up the article on the table at the back of the room about the landmark precedent setting Kawas versus Honduras case on the issue of environmental defenders. Even though this case took place in the Inter-American Human Rights Court, its requirement that governments must protect at-risk environmental activists has global relevance and should be utilized and cited by environmental and land defenders who are being attacked and criminalized around the world. Especially important is the epilogue, which contains critical advice for all land and environmental defenders and those shining a spotlight on and helping to protect these courageous activists. For those following on webcast or video, please grab the free article on my website, lauritanner.com, which is L-A-U-R-I-T-A-N-N-E-R. -N -N -E Thank you. Thanks, Lori. And the lady in black in the second row, uh, next to Joan. Buenas tardes, señora presidenta, delegados, panelistas. Mi nombre es Panelist. My name is Brenda Hernandez. And I'm from the, I'm a defender, land and environmental rights defender from Guatemala. I'm by UVOC, and I'm part of the committee of this very same country of the human rights defenders. I am a compatriot of Mr. of my compatriot Jorge Luis Morales, and to complement what he has already illustrated us initially, I would like to mention, I need to mention, in the year 2013, throughout 2013, this initiative has registered 618 attacks to female and male defenders, more than double of the t last year's total. Guatemala has the largest uh, right of these attacks in the hemisphere. And this conflict, in the scheme of tremendous social injustice, economic, political injustice, and th these peace initiatives have not been satisfied and has been remilitarized, but as of 2012, the state has been remilitarized and is an ex-military um, ex in the presidency. In terms of these, in, when we saw the Nuremberg trials, it has highlighted that perhaps the worst crimes committed against the Jewish community was the construction of the discourse of hate this year, this very year, in Guatemala. People were penalized and condemned which was murdered for genocide, and his sentence was and was annulled by the court, given the Constitution, in a retrograde act in terms of justice in the intervention of the business, the business uh, camera of business in our country. Within this, the case of this, this trial. Attacks to the indigenous minority rights, land rights, all these attacks are in augmented and they constitute accusations of terrorism, criminalization. It also includes the indigenous and religious organizations. Our own ombudsman declared this as a, quote, discourse of hate and held the president responsible by and an organization formed by ex-militaries and the massacres that were committed during this conflict. It was called Funda Foundation Against Terrorist Acts and its publications. Given this, posterior to this, before this, were extended against the land rights defenders 
which have maintained a legitimate fight, a legal legitimate fight against these abuses and, and these grave human rights violations and criminalization campaigns against them by these companies which have come from international capitals in Guatemala. Throughout this damage the government has allowed, this has engendered this discourse of hate and right now is joining sides with the companies, the directors of these companies, where our first our minister, our interior, minister of Interiors have called them, called gangsters and bandilleros. I'm sorry, Brenda. Brenda, Brenda, forgive me. You're really taking up quite a bit. Está tomando mucho, está ocupando mucho tiempo. Necesitamos darle el espacio a otras personas, Brenda. Ya hemos oído la... Can we please focus on the recommendations to the working group, to the UN system, to the other stakeholders? Um, please feel free to distribute information to the participants in writing or di digitally. I've got Just someone, said, a man at the back, who has been raising his hand. So, um, yes, you, please. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Thomas Jalong. I'm from uh, Sarawak, uh, Malaysia, and I'm, I come from a community which is also uh, going to be affected by a mega dam, uh, hydroelectric project dam, eh? and uh, it will affect more than 20,000 people. And uh, we have, uh, right from the beginning when we heard about this project, we have stated our position that we don't want this dam project because we prefer to live where we are, and it's also a question of uh, our right to our livelihood. And uh, despite that, the government and the company has sent some people to visit the communities where they said they were supposed to hold consultation and dialogue with us, but these are not dialogues, these are monologues. And uh, because what happened was that they only came and tell our people to accept the project. And when they went around, they went overseas, they say they have obtained the consent of our people through so-called consultation. So this is a misrepresentation -re of the actual situation. And uh, our people have started to take many uh, actions, peaceful actions, uh, at every level, right from the village until national level. And here I am here, coming here to also bring up this quest, uh, issue, uh, problems to the attention of the United Nations Working Group. And uh, what I'm worried, because in another case, in also in Sarawak, that is in Murum Dam, uh, 10 people were arrested uh, two weeks ago, where two, including two of the minors, and they were charged for uh, wrongful restraint in their effort to call for uh, negotiation with the government to work out the compensation that should be accorded to them. But in the process of trying to protect the in trying to ask for the dialogue and the negotiation, the, the dam which was uh, constructed near the area was, uh, was uh, already uh, being blocked and uh, Thomas, the empowerment was Thomas, carried out. Okay, so what are your recommendations going forward? I'm asking for uh, the intervention from the United Nations Working Group on this uh, business and human rights, uh, possibly also to visit our area, our state, and also to call on the state and the nation, uh, I mean our government, to ensure meaningful uh, implementation of this FPIC, because our government uh, always claim that they are complying with the UN trips. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Genevieve, and then um, uh, I'm just trying to see, some of you have recommendations and some of you don't, so let's keep it brief and I will then have Joan, the gentleman in green, and Phil, and that's that's it. That's it. Sorry. We, are, we have to vacate the room for the next session. Genevieve, Genevieve. 
Thank you, Debbie. Uh, two recommendations, the first one and to states, then the UN Working Group, second one, the Working Group. Um, I would like to thank um, Harriet for sharing with us uh, the steps that um, have been taken by, embassy, by the embassy to ensure direct protection of, the, of defenders, uh, not only the guidelines, but also suggesting that trial observations could be done. And I'd like to uh, make a recommendation that and extend it to other embassies because in our experience, um, the situation with many OECD embassies is that the human rights defenders are still perceived as disturbers or so-called enemies of development that can threaten the interest of, of businesses coming from these, these home states. And so there, there's clear need to, to recognize on the part of states uh, obligation to ensure policy coherence uh, that embassies should, should clearly recognize the role of human rights defenders and um, do anything they can to ensure uh, direct protection of, of these defenders. And a recommendation to the, to the UN uh, working group would be that uh, Public statement recognizing the crucial role of human rights defenders would surely be very useful for, for their work, but also um, we'd like to see the working group formulating recommendations not only to states, including how they should avoid to use, for instance, anti-terrorism laws against human rights defenders, but also recommendations directed at companies on what they should or should not do um, to, as part of their duty to, uh, responsibility to protect human rights, to um, ensure the, the protection of the work, or the work of human rights defenders. Thank you. Joan, that's you, right? Yeah. Microphone. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm John Kerling with the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, and we also act as the Secretariat of the Indigenous Peoples Human Rights Defenders and also the Asia Indigenous Peoples Network on Extractive Industries and Energy. I have two points to add to already the discussions uh, this morning. One is the issue of the use of private armies and paramilitary forces in, in going after human rights defenders, especially those who are defending their lands, territories, and resources. And, and the other one is the way land rights is recognized is also violating our collective land rights, leading to more land grabbing of indigenous lands. And I'm talking of uh, countries like India, Cambodia, and even the Philippines, where laws that, that are uh, already protecting our collective rights are being used to recognize individual lands or, or, or families or members of the communities are forced uh, to apply for individual lands and whereby companies can easily then pressure them to sell out. So it's a, it's a very uh, systematic way of, 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 of land grabbing um, that is used against uh, indigenous peoples. So along this line, I have uh, several recommendations. First is that uh, paramilitary forces used by, I, I mean that private companies or companies using private armies shall not be allowed to operate in indigenous territories. And uh, there should be strict regulations and policies and it's a strong enforcement in relation to activities of private armies and paramilitary uh, forces, especially in, in dealing with uh, human rights defenders, that there should be human rights education for military uh, units, and, and, and finally, for the prevention of the worsening conditions of indigenous human rights defenders, is for states and business to fully recognize, respect, and protect the collective rights of indigenous peoples to their lands, territories, and resources, to self-governance and to self-determined development. Further, the establishment of effective mechanisms for redress at the local and national levels should be done immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. I've just been informed that I have to halt the session. We have run out of time. I am so sorry. All I can do is to say all of us heard you. All of us heard you, and we hope that this can be taken further. Let's not forget 
that some of the issues that you raise will also be relevant to the side event tomorrow at 12 to 1.30 in room 23 on cases in the extractive sector. Some of your cases, some of the issues you wanted to raise are relevant there. Thank you very much to our panelists, Harriet, Jorge, Samuel and Pavel, and to the 12 organizing, uh, 12 organizers, the 12 uh, groups that organized this, and thank you to the translators.